use your prompt. I'm just going to show it here for a second. Shoot, I forgot to record. So um, at the beginning of class, we're going to be talking about rhetoric in our next unit. And rhetoric is just the means of persuasion, um, what we do in order to persuade. So I think that everything we do has kind of argumentative readings behind it. Like, um, you know, the fact that I am, well, I'm going to talk about this in a second. The fact that in my classroom, I've got like pictures of women everywhere. I'm like conveying this like subtle feminist argument to get you all to become feminists, right? That's what people who are afraid of me would say. Um, but there is a kind of argument to everything that we do. So right now I am having them all talk about their outfits and what they think their outfit is conveying about them, what argument their outfit is making about them. So if you missed, write down in part of, as part of your notes, what does your outfit right now convey about you? <laughs> <laughs> Did everyone get a chance to talk about their own outfit? I'm gonna make a lot of clothing that's called tie down. <laughs> All right, so sometimes we're totally in control of the arguments that we are making and sometimes we aren't. I am not a very fashionable person. I'm not always in control of the arguments I'm making, but that doesn't mean that my outfit isn't making an argument. Um, so today I'm looking, how'd that happen? wet spots all over okay well that makes a kind of argument about my like <laughs> level of sloppiness right um i think that my outfit like very clearly shows my age i think i'm making the argument that i'm like a millennial i'm very clearly a millennial i'm wearing my skinny jeans and i will always wear them um i think that the shoes their dad shoes like i got them in the men's section of ross dress for less <laughs> so i think that's saying a little bit of something about me about like how much I care about fashion, like not very much at all, um, but also sort of like, I don't know what my priorities are. Like my priorities would be like definitely spending less on these sorts of things. My shirt, like today actually very clearly relays an argument. I went to the University of Utah and I want you to know that. I also think you get a sense of my like levels of conformity here because it's college week and they asked us to wear the clothes from our, our uh, schools. And I was like, oh, this could be a good day to wear because we're all wearing jerseys or whatever. So I'm like kind of fitting. I'm, the argument I'm conveying today is like school spirit a little bit, I think. Like I'm kind of fitting in doing what I'm supposed to do. Um, and I think my hair conveys how tired I am today <laughs> and how like I just like whatever, showering what's that um so <laughs> so i think like subtly all of the stuff even though it's like a very casual outfit i don't think i'm like um you know being fashion forward or anything i think subtly it is conveying a kind of argument about me oh last glasses i could get contacts i don't have problems with like sticking stuff in my eyes or whatever i don't think um but i want to show you how smart i am and i think glasses <laughs> I think glasses do better with that. Um, and I'm not wearing my mask today. I kind of like have given up a little bit on the mask thing because it doesn't seem like as many kids are sitting in my class sick this week as they were a couple weeks ago. Oh no. Um, so so that kind of conveys a little bit of lack, lackadaisical, like um, I'm not, I don't know, maybe I'm not as good as an example as I'd like to be, but all right. So all of those details, there's so much. Um, I want to look at your outfits now. Let's do a fashion show. Does somebody want to volunteer? JJ, show us your catwalk. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we've got a Smurf t-shirt. I want to see the back too. Okay, so a lazy Smurf t-shirt. We've got shorts, even though we're starting to get into the 50 degrees, right? Yep. Okay. What is that around your ankle? Uh, we want Jason Derulo and Hope. Wait, it is, it's no, it's what would Jesus be right? Okay. And then a, a hope tag. Okay, but as an anklet, I think it's important. <laughs> Adidas. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, all right. Blonde, very tan. 
let's let's make some assumptions about him. Um, you might know him, but let's like figure out what his outfit or what you know, like the presentation is conveying about him. He likes the Smurfs. <laughs> what would it mean that he liked the Smurfs? What would that tell us about him as a person? Bubbly. Yeah, there's a kind of like yeah, there's like an inner child here. I think. Inner or an outward child. Yeah. This is uh, 11th grade honors. <laughs> Why did he get scared? <laughs> Don't know what the story is. I don't think he got scared. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So inner child and outer child, because he's willing to display his inner child. Anything about the Smurfs in particular? I don't really know. Are there still Smurfs or shows, or is it all from like the 80s? There were those Smurfs movies. Are definitely real. But those, these are like, <laughs> this is like cartoon Smurf, right? So yeah. to me, there's like a bit of like, like nostalgia there too. Like for a kid your age to like wear a Smurf shirt, I think it's exactly. something different. He probably does and he doesn't really care. I don't know. Knows stuff. <laughs> research. Yeah. Do research. So it's more of a vintage. <laughs> it's more of a vintage thing, right? It, it's yeah. sort of like wearing like something cool from the past to like sh either I don't know what that is about. And what I is that about? Huh? I look like Smurfette. Do you? He does. <laughs> He's got blonde hair. Okay. Okay. All right. Tell me about shorts in winter. I mean, I know it's not winter. Oh, I do it all the time. There's not a lot it's of soccer. It's all. Cool. It's, it's definitely it's a soccer. It's thing. definitely a soccer. We, we just get we just get used to running in the cold. And yeah, shorts. our legs yeah. don't care. Okay, so even if I didn't know that he was into soccer, though, I feel like shorts in this weather does show a kind of athleticism a little bit. I always I always feel like athletic people are wearing shorts more often. And I hike, so I hike thirteen thousand foot mountains, and I just wear shorts. And so you're just like used to it no matter what. Okay. okay, tell me about the anklets. I'm going to keep calling them anklets. What does that tell us about? Here's how we have to decide. Open like sea level. Yeah. We want Jason to prove. Here's how we have to decide. Is the WWJD ironic or not? Yeah. I have a tan line. <laughs> so you don't feel like he's actually wearing it as a Christian. He's wearing it as a kind of like make fun of what would Jesus I think it's more like it's Christian support, but also make fun of it like together. Okay. How? Okay. I get that. How, okay. So it's the combination of the two then, right? It's the Smurfs t-shirt with the WWJD. All right. Okay. okay. Tell me personality traits then. We've, the we've examined his outfit. His outgoing is confident and he's a child. Awesome. In a good way. <laughs> a little bit, a little immature. Not, not, a not, immature. immature. not immature. Oh, okay. He is, he is his he age. Is ah, I see. I see. He's not trying to be something he's not. Then. And yeah. that goes with the confidence too. More which yeah. you are. Yeah. Which is, oh, totally agree. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Sit down. Yeah. <laughs> I think we did a good job. Does anyone else want to submit themselves to a fashion show? I don't think Kendall really wants to. Come on, come on. Yeah. Just so we can roast. Things. Just so you can watch me get up slowly. And remind Is it broken? Oh, so he's got weak bones. That's what I'm talking about. Doesn't drink enough milk. Yeah. All right. That's okay. You guys get the idea, right? Like everything that we do on, on that's like, that is outwardly displayed at all can be read as some kind of argument, which means like literally everything could be read as some kind of argument, whether that is explicit or implicit. So we have to figure out how do we read other people's arguments and how do we interpret those arguments and if we're interpreting them correctly. But we also want to be aware of when other people are making arguments so that we can like decide if we want to be manipulated or not. Um, I don't use manipulation necessarily as a bad thing. It's just something like, do you want to comply with that argument and go along with it or do you want to resist it? And the only way to find that out is to figure out, like, if, is to really articulate what the arguments are and how somebody is making that argument. So in order to do that, we do something called rhetorical analysis. Um, and that's where the rhetorical triangle comes in. So take some notes on what this triangle looks like. This is probably familiar to 
almost all of you at this point, because I know Ms. Shirtlift says this stuff too. Is that true? No. Does she talk about logos, ethos, pathos? Yes. Okay, that's where this comes in. Okay, so this won't be this won't be new, I don't think, to hardly anyone. But before we get to logos, ethos, pathos, let's talk about this rhetorical triangle. So as part of the rhetorical triangle, you have the writer, or in this case, the dresser. You have the person who is creating the argument, right? You also have an audience. So whatever your partner told you maybe, or gave you feedback about what you what you looked like, that's your audience. For JJ, for JJ, it was the whole class, right? That was judging him based on looks. It's not a great activity now that I think about it, but um, it's all like making these judgments, right? So that's the audience. The writer ultimately wants to affect the audience. That is absolutely true. You, as, a, as someone who's making an argument, want your audience to change in some way according to your argument but the audience is also going to have an effect on the writer because the writer needs to choose appropriate arguments for the audience that they think the audience is going to want to hear so if you came to school i don't know in a t-shirt that's like everyone should smoke marijuana and like underwear <laughs> and you came walking through the hallways you are not dressing for the appropriate audience right so it is not all just about what you want to do it is also about you reacting and and making choices based on who your audience is and with clothing we do that i mean just implicitly all the time whether you want to say that you're not doing it to like be seen a certain way you are right so that kind of works both ways up here you have the subject this in our in our argument is the actual clothing that's the subject the thing that the the structure of the argument itself so the writer is influencing the subject they are making choices about how they want to present themselves right the subject influences the writer certain arguments are going to speak to us in a certain way and we're we're um, compelled by certain arguments the subject is also going to speak to the audience because ultimately that's what we want to happen. We want the writer to craft their subject so that it influences the audience. But same way this works, the audience is also going to be influencing the subject because we're doing things with that audience in mind. So the whole point here is that they're all working on each other and what ends up happening is that triangle constricts so that what is included in a good argument has to fall somewhere inside that triangle. That makes sense so far. Okay, so let's do this with like an argument like school uniforms. Let's say I am somebody who wants school uniforms. I'm pro. I want there to be school uniforms in our school. Um, what are all the different arguments that we could make just across the board? What are the arguments you could make to enforce school uniforms at school? I mean, if, I mean, I don't necessarily want them. I'm just saying like as a hypothetical. Okay. So that things like what happened to JJ will happen to no one else. Yes. <laughs> Strive. Good. All right. What else could be an argument for school uniforms? Yeah. It's professional. All right. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, a lot easier, you know, they still have those conversations, but if you're like, I don't know, if you're not allowing jeans, then you don't have to worry about where the rinse and the jeans are, you know, and that will help the admin. I also see like how there could be an argument made that it'll make things less awkward for the students then too. Um, because I don't know if you've been dress coded, but I hear it's not a great experience <laughs> having having an admin be like, this is wrong and this is wrong, you know, so that we can just like avoid that conversation entirely. Katie? It makes it more equal for dress coding too because it's going to, it's just easier to dress code. Ah, good. You know, and equal between boys and girls then too, I think. JJ? Um, take away some stereotypes. What do you mean? Um, this is going to sound a little bad and harsh, but like, or rich. Yes, absolutely. So like class based. Yeah. Um, it might also just be like group based too. Uh, how would I say that? Like you can take away those stereotypes for political persuasion or like what kind of music you like, or you can still convey that like with your hairstyles or whatever, but like it's gonna lessen some of that 
like stereotyping. Good. Anything else? Yeah. School unity. Awesome. It's going to promote this like unity among the school. Promote school unity so that someone on the street sees us in a Harriman High School uniform and they're like that kid's Harriman High School and you see each other and you can recognize each other and go Harriman High School. Anything else? Um, I think I think this could be one. They look cute. <laughs> I think you know school some school uniforms like I'm watching Gilmore Girls right now. Rory looks adorable in her school uniform in that show, right? Some of them can be cute. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it as an argument, a potential argument you can make. Another argument that people make for these, uh, cost less. You only have to buy a couple outfits and then just like wash them twice a week and you're pretty much good, right? So there's like, for parents, maybe that could be, uh, or even kids too, I mean, that's going to be an argument. Is there anything else that you can think of? Let's pretty much cover why schools would ever have school uniforms. Okay, cool. So if these are all the reasons, if we tried to fit all of these inside a rhetorical triangle and write a paper about it or make a presentation about it, it's way too many. You're just going to go through this list of like, and this, and this, and this, and there's going to be no cohesion. So if you want to choose what's best inside the triangle, you have to know who your audience is. And so let's think of who could be who would be the most important to get them on your side for making this case for school uniforms? Yeah, the principal. Okay, so it might be the principal. Or just like admin. Yeah, like yeah. get his whole team behind it, maybe even at the district level. Okay. Any other groups that we might need to influence that might be more important? Jack? Okay, let's get the students on board, get them to buy in so they're happy to have uniforms. Dash? Uh, the parents. Parents, yes, let's get them on board. And there are probably one more that could be, yeah, district. Yeah, okay. So, like, I'm going to put district and like school board here. All right. So, those are who makes decisions in our schools, right? I guess you could say teachers could be on here, but no one's going to argue that they have the influence, right? All right. So, <laughs> out of all of these, who do you think has the most power in deciding what happens in the schools? Okay. Make the argument that it's the school board to me. Okay, so they don't need the students to like be on board with them, right? Everyone else has to Good point. Yeah, they actually get to create. Yeah, they actually get to create. The the students love the Fridays, but they said no. Yeah, and I think the Fridays thing is a really good argument for why school boards would be most compelled by this. Um, I'm going to make an argument though, that except for Fridays, that's the only time I've ever seen this. I think this is the most important. And here's why, except for Fridays, which parents did want Fridays the way they oh, were yeah. too. But except for that, parents vote in the school board. It's like the voting public. And so if the school board wants to maintain their seats, which I don't know why they want to, but they do, they need the votes of parents. So let's stick with, just because I say so, let's stick with parents. Out of all of these reasons, which one do you think parents are going to like the best? <laughs> parents want you want their kids to look cute. Aw. I think money. Okay. Between these two, which one do you think? Probably oh, cost more. I think so too. All right. So cost less as our reason creates this compelling argument. It doesn't mean that you can't bring up other things as a sort of example of why that's gonna be important. Like because it costs less it takes away stereotypes. But those two things are so closely connected. If you make this the most compelling part of your argument, you might have a chance to get school uniforms if, that's, if they agree that that's true. All right, does this make sense for how to com combine the argument then? All right, cool. So then here are the Latin terms. So there are Latin terms associated with how you appeal to each part of this rhetorical triangle. So if you are appealing to an audience's trust in the writer, you are appealing to their sense of ethos. So ethos is about the credibility of the writer. We don't want to listen to people that we don't think are trustworthy, obviously. Um, so if we don't think the writer is trustworthy on all sorts of issues, we're not going to listen to him on this issue sometimes. So in order to prove that you're someone worth listening to, you have to appeal to someone's sense of ethos, their desire to want to trust the person speaking. All right, for subject, you are appealing to an audience's logos or sense of reason or logic. So every person 
is a I mean, part of what defines us as humans is we're rational beings. And so whenever you're appealing to someone's sense of rationality, then you are appealing to logos. And usually that's through different kinds of logic. Like if I show you that there's a cause and effect, uniforms cost less. And so that leads to less uh, stereotyping in school because everyone can afford the same outfits. That's a cause and effect logic. I'm appealing to someone's sense of logos. All right, and then audience ran out of space here. If you're appealing to your audience, you are appealing to your audience. Well, you're always appealing to your audience. If you are looking at your audience's values, you are looking at pathos. Appealing to audiences values. Okay, so in the past, you might have been taught that pathos means emotions then, creating emotions in your audience. And that's true, those two things are kind of aligned, but it is because you're not appealing to their value, if you're not appealing to their logic, you're appealing to what they hold dear, their values. And often that looks like an emotional kind of emotional appeal. But if you like really focus on this idea of stereotypes and you're like, we need equity in our schools, you know, kids, not all kids have access to public education when people are criticizing them for their outfits and so on. You might not be using the most emotional language ever, but you're still appealing to their sense of values and like equity in school. The looks cute argument would be a very, a very pathos centered argument. Okay, so with this in mind, let's do a different argument now. Let's talk about homework. <laughs> All right, so you wrote this one ahead of time. Let's keep with the black marker, that's a good marker. You tell me all of the reasons you wrote and that you think <laughs> of that we should not have homework in school. That teachers should not assign homework. Go be it. So, like time balance? Yeah, like balance and what you're doing. Ah, okay. All right, cool. So, it doesn't teach that kind of balance in your commitment, which is like a good life lesson. And because of that, uh, homework can like lessen. So, let's put it this way no homework would increase. Mental health is that even a phrase that you could say, but increase difficulty. Yes. Um, so like relaxing is as important as learning as like actually getting the content and homework destroys the ability to learn. Relaxing is important to learning. Yeah, you need time when your brain is not like working on stuff constantly. Yeah, Jamie. I think anxiety and stress. Okay, so no homework is going to reduce anxiety and stress. Awesome. Eli? It's almost always just busy work. It's very rarely actually teaching you anything. All right. It's just to fill time. Busy work, filling time. Not to actually teach. Okay, good. Rachel? Um, I, also, with all the teachers, almost all of them giving homework, uh -huh. it would just be way too much to actually work on. Okay, so it's, this is especially in high school, right? Too many teachers equals impossible time commitments. Like there isn't actually enough time in the day. Com com commits. Commits. Okay, I know that's wrong. All right. Yeah, so yeah. Okay, so it's like you have to do it without the teacher there because someone, um, because no one's there to help you. So pause bad habits because no one is there to help or to ask like questions, clarifying questions. Yeah, Gavin? Wait, oh yeah, 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 okay. So no homework allows people to focus on themselves. And I mean, we just spent an entire unit talking about why that might be important, right? Yeah. No, with notes, you, you, you're you going to learn through the notes. Like if you take notes in class with everyone else, you're going to learn. Okay. You will learn in class because notes, you don't need that homework to. Also, what's with 
doing a review packet, taking notes on the entire review packet, taking the test, and there's nothing on your note card that is on the test. What is with that? That's so <laughs> taking down notes. So that is really like, notes frustrating. Are yeah. things and study it later, which writing the notes for questions. That also makes me feel notes. like that That's also makes me feel guess, less right? about myself because I was like, okay, I get it. I get how I'm supposed to do this. Yeah. And now it's like <laughs> degrading. <laughs> so so homework is not always aligned with like what you're supposed to be learning. Yeah, the overall goal is you suck at this math. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I feel like I'm accomplishing. Okay, I got it. All right. Yeah, Sophia. Okay. Yeah. All right. So some people, so I think those are two different things. Like some people don't have the privileges of like having a parent that's like an astrophysicist that can help them with their math homework, right? Or they have to work and make money for their family. But then you're also talking about how some people have extracurriculars. And that is another part of this impossible um, time commitments that you have. Yeah, Katie. Um, a lot of people cheat on their homework, so they don't. Mm. Have Oh, they cheat. I've never heard of such a thing. Yeah. So no homework like prevents cheaters because there's just nothing for them to cheat on. Okay. Yeah, Jake. When you do homework, you often do it alone. Uh huh. So you're not getting socially like you're not socially helping yourself. Good. You're not growing socially, which seems to be I mean social emotional learning. That's what we've been talking about so much in school lately. Okay. All good reasons. We're going to add to those in a second if you want to. Your audience for this is me. Okay, so Dr. Bora, you got to find, you have to figure out what you know about me that you think would be relevant to convincing me not to give you any more homework. Um, you can ask me questions. If you oh, want to. oh, oh, I already know. Okay. What? We're going to make a list of characteristics. In Emerson's, uh, would it be our divine purpose to do homework? Is it, is it our responsibility to do this stuff that we're not even wanting? To okay, do? so this could be another reason to add up here, like My purpose is to learn. not no, following no, wins. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> homework. Oh wait, not having homework would allow you to follow your whims, right? Which definitely goes with what Gavin said too. Um, your whims, but over here, maybe you need to know if I am a transcendentalist. Are you a transcendentalist? Yeah. Oh, no. No, I don't think we're divine. We're awful. <laughs> transcendentalism is just a huge American philosophical interest. So that's what I, I teach it. But like, I think people at their core are like kind of terrible. So I don't know that that's going to be compelling to me. All right. What else do you? What else do you know about me as a teacher? Like, what I value, or what do you need to know in order to decide how to make it? Okay. Good. I grade. But you don't want to have to grade what you did the time. Yeah, maybe not, right? Yeah, Gavin. Yeah. I do. I love literature. And you said moving literature, right? Yeah. And I think part of that is because I like believe in it. You know, like I believe in the power of literature to make our lives better. Yes, friend. Do you value our mental health? No. Uh, yes. <laughs> I like how she's thinking. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I totally do. Yeah, you still get homework. Yes. <laughs> totally I think my homework, I think in two ways. Yeah. I think I your writing it. homework is like is definitely helping prepare you for and I know this is a cliche, but prepare you for college, like the kind of writing homework I give you is very similar to the kind I was giving college students. So that part, I think, yes. But then I think a, a lot of the homework we do in here is just preparing you for the discussion the next day. And so I want you to be able to come to class and, and have this like discussion about Emerson or whatever. So that's why I make you do annotations because it makes it, the discussion better. So that's how, okay, so um, homework equals preparation for college. <laughs> and uh, preparation for discussions. Right, Jean? 
Hold on, you, you say uh, you care about our mental value and then you switch our seats around? <laughs> okay. Is it more because I think you'll have better no, mental health. How does those four empty seats over there? Yeah, <laughs> maybe. I think it's for you. Maybe I care about the mental health of everyone in the class and not just four or five people over here, right? Okay, Gavin. <laughs> and yes, okay, good. So I really want. you to be able to think critically about stuff. Um, and by that, I mean, I want you to be able to find those hidden meanings and things so that you're gonna be able to make decisions for yourself in the future and you won't have to rely on other people. Yeah, Katie. Would you rather have us ask you questions when we're doing like our first draft and then for the ink, or would you rather give us feedback after? Both. Keep that less questions. But that's a chameleon. I mean, keep going down that track when we're adding to our to our reasons over there. Anything else you need to know about me to know how to convince me? Yeah, you almost kind of inefficient because what this may be a lazy way of teaching, but it means more work than you think. Yes. So it appeals to your sense of motivated laziness. Wait, what do you mean by that? As in, like, <laughs> you want to have better benefits for us and you in the long term, so you don't have to do a bunch of work. But in the short term, means you have more work to make assignments that are better for us and you. So you don't just like make a worksheet of notes, send everybody, you have to look through it. So yes. You craft something so you don't have to do more. Yes, work. exactly. Okay, so I am deaf. That is so true about me. Homework equals less work for me what? in the future. <laughs> So it's like, I am giving homework now and, and I give homework to you so that discussions are easier the next day for you, but uh, like for me too, right? So it's like so much less work for me up here when you've actually read the material. Or when you, is this what you kind of meant by this? I meant like, you give homework in a different way than other teachers where it's, it's, a, it's a discussion to learn so that you can understand it better. Yes. Other teachers, it's do these 20 problems, fill this two page note packet, grade it. Yes, okay, so good. My homework, so um, you would, they put in just a bunch of like papers and assignments as a grade on Canvas. You like actually give discussions <laughs> and trying to teach. <laughs> That's, yeah, and so I'm hoping it's not as much busy work. So if you're going to argue against my homework, you have, you're, the busy work argument might not work so much because I'll yeah. say my homework's not busy work. That's not you know? Work. Yeah. Yeah, right? Do you have an hour and a half class time two or three times a day? A week it's and true. you still can't teach us all the English three things you want to teach. Right? So what does that mean about me? Uh, I get sidetracked, maybe. Or no, what could that mean about me? It just feels like a criticism. I'm trying to turn it into something you know about me. <laughs> too much work. Okay, cool. <laughs> I care too much. All right. All right. All right. I definitely get that. Actually, that's what my husband tells me all the time. He's always like, he, he's always just like, why do they have to learn those things? Just like, don't, don't teach them that. No, I just do a movie. Like, what's the problem? <laughs> all right. Good. All right. Is there anything else you need to know about me or you know about me that we should put up here? I do. There's a lot of like time, like, Movie is like two hours, right? Could yeah. You do like all of your homework for a class in two hours. Good point. Good point. Yeah. Taking away our ability to watch movies. Good point. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so then you get to watch movies. You should be able to watch movies instead of doing homework. Yeah. And right. you relate to us that way, but yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. Based on what we listed up here, what you know about me and didn't say, or like what you suspect. Yeah. In your groups now, the, the group of four, I want you to write a thesis statement that you think is going to appeal to me. So you could add reasons now. Um, actually, yes, you could add reasons to the bull. Keep, keep changing my mind, sorry. Let's add reasons now. Is there Are there any reasons that you want to add up here that you think are gonna be better for me? Like I heard the thing about movies, let's put that up here. I think you just straight up write that homework's time consuming? Yeah. For me and for you? Yeah. All right, anything else we should add up here? 
to address what you think I need um, to hear? It's not as like interactive or anything. Like, you know, yeah. Discussion. All right, now at this point, if there's something up here that you want to add, feel free to do that. You don't have to just stick to these, but you're going to choose a way to narrow the argument. So remember, it's got to fit within this rhetorical triangle. You don't need it to be a whole bunch of different things. You want it to be one solid reason, and maybe you could connect them together, but one solid focus to the paper that you think is going to be the most compelling to me. So you're going to write a thesis statement. We should not have homework because, and you're going to say why, why I should stop this any homework. Okay, write this in your group, but everybody write it down on the paper. So what, what were you guys focusing on for your reasons? What were the reasons that you think are going to be the most compelling to me? Psychologically harmful. Psychologically harmful. So like these ones. These ones? Yep. Those two. Okay. Okay, so kind of focusing on like, so let me ask you this. How many of you guys included something about like stress or anxiety in my students that we need to help reduce? Okay. So for those of you guys that included that, what is it about your audience that you felt like that could be a compelling argument? I, I just thought of that first just because of the period we're in now, like depression. It, it's like yeah. so overcoming, overcoming that right. homework. Why add to that when you could like first parents, like I'm going for the parents right now because they're so like, yeah, why would I add more stress to my kid if he already has enough? Yeah, good that. point. And so, uh, like, as the teacher, too, like, I am aware of, like, sort of conversations around that. And I was here, you know, a few years ago when we had, like, a slew of suicides. And I don't think those were homework related from what I understand. But, you know, that, that's something that we are aware of. Um, and so that could be a good, that could be a good way to convince me. Anyone have other ideas about why you would include like something about student mental health for this audience, Jack? I do. I totally care about you. I would say I, I'm hoping at least that you've got other teachers that do too, and they maybe just aren't as good as can you see. Outwardly, I care about you. Both. 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 I care about you. Okay, and here's what's so important about that. The fact that I'm like trying to present it that way, I don't care about you at all, actually. But um, oh, <laughs> the fact that I'm trying to present it that way means that that's like an important part of my identity, right? So if you're trying to like get me to be in line with that part of my identity by being like, well, you're the caring teacher, so like obviously you care about us, you know, like making those assumptions out loud, that could be effective. Yeah. Katie, um, even if you like didn't care about our mental health, you'd have to pretend. Exactly. So that, like, yeah. They didn't like go to the administration or like, hey, Dr. Forbes doesn't even care about me at all. Right. Yeah. Totally. So part of it's like might be about keeping my job too, but it's something about that hour play. Yeah. So you care about us learning, and mental health can affect learning. Okay. So, so how many of you guys? Yeah. Arguments, please. Did you combine this idea of stress and anxiety with effectiveness of learning? Because that might be a better way to go about it. Because yes, of course I care about you, but also like I'm not your parent or friend, right? And so maybe like the way that I care about you is like through you learning this stuff. So if you can like combine those two together in your argument, that might be more important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that we're like, why all like the factors that we're supposed to be just as in depth learning as we would in class. Okay. Like, I can understand the class because it's good if we have these discussions to play back and forth back. Yeah, and you, I think that group then is noticing like how the class is usually structured that I do like to have a lot of discussion. So looking at all of this like private work that you would do at home, like alone and secluded, I, I agree, like it's probably not going to get to that much deep understanding. So that could be a good way to go about it. Yeah. Yeah. Going along with that, like if you're studying or studying is good, but if you're studying by yourself and not like with others, you get multiple different ideas. Yeah. To that one topic. And that could change your whole like way of thinking about it. Right. So like this idea of growing socially, but like with your learning, yeah. not just like with your friends. So you don't answer the question. Yeah. Yeah. Or if the, so that there's lots of different right answers and you're like exposed to all of them. Did anybody else focus on something different up here? Yeah. It it's really hard to make homework not just be busy work, like it yeah. doesn't serve a purpose that way. So you, you have a lot more time just trying to figure out how to spend the time you are doing homework to just make more meaningful learning in the class. Got it. So it's like better, like better used prep time. Yeah, like 
making homework not busy work is just kind of wasted time. Yeah, yeah, because it does take me a really long time to figure out those, like how to word those assignments and stuff. Okay, yeah, Rachel. I think especially being an honors class that you want to bypass a lot more of the busy work because uh -huh. you actually want to do stuff that will contribute to the class, like your essays and stuff actually go into right. this and interaction with you so that you really want to have a priority in the process and our discussions with everybody. Yes. And homework doesn't really do that for us. It doesn't contribute back to the class. And that's kind of where you're dividing like anything that's not essays from like homework. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, anybody else focus on any more of these? Yeah, I got Yeah, and I feel like then it's like you're kind of reading into what my politics might be a little bit that I would want to like inspire you guys to go out and be a little activists, you know. Um, I think that's I think that's kind of true too. I think if we could have added up here like that I'm like all about the labor revolution that's happening right now with like everyone quitting their jobs and like spending more time on themselves, like that seems like a positive to me. So that could be one thing, like my ideals about like you guys valuing free time and like leisure time. To, pursue your own interests are not lining up with the way that I am giving you homework and like taking up all your time. So I think I'm good on your homework. Yeah, so we just kind of said time consuming because we do like a lot of supporting arguments like because we don't have time we have to go on mental health and like because we don't have time we don't have time because of like extracurricular like, yeah like, yeah let me ask you this I totally agree with that but there's some time commitments that aren't going to be as compelling to me. What do you think up here you should steer clear of if you're trying to convince me to not have homework? Probably the other teacher thing because you're just focusing on like on you as being right? I think any teacher doesn't want to hear that. Like they're yeah. all just like, well, but mine's the most important, you know? Yeah. So like just don't do math. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a good one not to avoid. Are there any others? Yeah, you extracurriculars number 12, because like that's kind of saying you don't prioritize your class and don't really evaluate as much as anyone else. Yeah, and if you know me, you know like I'm a really big nerd. So if you're like, but I gotta focus on soccer, I'm just like, why? You know, like there's no use to soccer, <laughs> not not that that's true. I'm just talking about my own biases. So that might be one to steer clear. Yeah, Jaden. Yeah. Um, how about the cheating one? Yeah. Don't talk about that with me because I'm just gonna be like, why are you cheating? Like that's gonna like if you're just like it'll prevent people from cheating, immediately I'm gonna think you're the cheater, you know. <laughs> um, all right, any others? Not that I, I don't remember who said that, so I'm not assuming that about you. Okay, I think you did, I think you're doing a good job. Um, let me ask you about this. How as far as like busy work is what in this class have you have you felt so far could be considered like busy work? None of them. Shoot. But really. <laughs> yeah. The annotations. The annotations. Okay. How are we feeling yeah. about annotations? Wait, uh, just about homework and kids. I so I asked a teacher, I was like, so in a job, like, would I use this in the future? And the teacher's like, no. <laughs> what was the, the why was the prison map? Oh, yes. uh, I mean geometry. I get geometry. Yeah, it's geometry, geometry is like is architecture and yeah. like all these. But, and if you become an engineer, you'll use yeah. it. You know. So, but I'm not really planning to become an engineer. I mean, yeah, that'd be cool to learn. But there, there are some like things that we're learning that don't matter. They're like, yeah, okay. you will never use this in your life. So potentially this yeah, argument might be better, better for some classes than others yeah. for you. Okay. Yeah, Katie. Um, with more annotations, more. yes, it matters a lot. Like we're an honors class. A lot of us have like a higher reading comprehension, totally. and faster reading time. And so it's like, we can just like read the whole passage and just know what it's about. That's true. Like, so like, like the tall way of the argument. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, bro. I'm going to kind of contradict what she said, sort of. But just saying like, like when we're in class and you're like going through the text and explaining it, then I'm like, oh, that's what she meant by like the prison door. Yeah. You know? But yeah. what I thought it was like a legit door. Right. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you think you get closer to those underlying meanings when you're having to go slower with annotations? Mm -hmm. I think yeah. it's useful to I don't know. Yeah. Like, Maybe not for some people. Like, yeah. more yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's much better. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Dash. So like with the throw letter annotations, like I understand you did it to like kind of make sure you actually read it. Yeah, that was more of a like, yeah, but like check it out. I did I worked super hard on it. It took me a long time. I was really proud of my annotations. You looked at two of my papers. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was just like, oh, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you want to bring them to me, I will look at them. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's okay. I, I have like a list that like the animation part I feel like the only one thing that we talked about was discussing. Like, yeah. when I was doing my animation for this project, it was kind of like actually tying it on to something. And it wasn't really registered, but like yeah. when we did it together and then we were completely like in the back. I felt like that actually, like, I actually yeah. like what we were doing and it kind of just stood up with me because I feel like everybody like, had like, like, opinions yeah. on it and we were in community. Yeah. And that made me feel like we were in yeah. class. Do you think that they're getting your annotations are getting better though after you have heard some of those expectations? Yeah. Okay. I just feel like it's just but that summer one is not. That's the. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Summer annotations. That felt like the key word for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Just really on what she said is that by the last five chapters of Scarlet Letter, I was just writing like cool. Yeah, you were. They were for sure. Yeah. It was just, I just wanted to get it over with. Right. Right. And yeah. Okay. Like that in fact fishing. It's just like. They just feel meaningless. Yeah. Like I'm underlining this word because I need one more thing on the page to make it look cool. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so here's what I'm hearing. Here's what, here's what I'm hearing. If we are going to do annotations, they need to be guided with more of a purpose. So if I'm saying, okay, you're going to read this Frederick Douglass stuff and annotate it, you better be looking for these three things. And I want to see that you're identifying these three things, and that will make it less like busy work. Okay, and then the other thing I'm hearing though is that maybe some stuff it would be better to not have the annotations at all. Like, okay, so then how can I, as a, from a teacher's perspective, give me an alternative. How can I um, check that you actually did the reading? Because be honest with yourself, you wouldn't always do the reading if I didn't make you do the annotations, right? Yes, okay, thank you. I think most people, yeah. I think we just have more the same in class. Like with Emerson. But some people are just quiet. That's true. But with Emerson, like there, also like it depends on like the passage, how big it is. Yeah. With Emerson, it wasn't very big, but I could still like all get one yeah. thing, out, like get a certain thing out. Right. So it could be that I'm asking what that certain thing is. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. The paragraphs about seeing the parking. So like response paragraphs are more useful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of what I was gonna say, or like. Something like if we read it and for like the third or like whenever we have groups, we could have like you we have to like write a summary of what like, we want to be read it and see like when we read it. Yeah. Or, like, we actually and when you say summary, you're not talking about like the very intensely graded summaries like I made no, you do, no, but something like, that's just, checking for understanding. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Is that yeah. something that you would do as homework? Is that something you do as well, you probably just like bullet points like this? Bullet points. Yeah, just more like those points. Yeah. Or, like what we did. Yeah, like the five minute writing time. Okay, so yeah, so and then to starter, I check for understanding. Yeah. 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 What you guys are describing is more work for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah, you're good. You're good to go. Okay, so here's here's my uh, here's my compromise. Um, for this first Frederick Douglass assignment, I have already made it, so I do want you to do annotations. When you do them, you are looking for ways that he is appealing to ethos. Logos and pathos. And I want you to find at least, or are you going to the track thing too, yes, Eli? This is important. Okay, cool. So I want you to find in each chapter at least two for each. So you're finding two places in each chapter where they're appealing to logos or ethos and pathos. Does that make sense? So for each chapter, like six annotations for each chapter. Yeah, and to the side, you can just write logos, ethos, and pathos for the annotations. You don't need to take notes, just write what you think is being appealed to for it. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that I think is a good compromise for this one. Yeah. Okay. I'm in the whole book. So oh, so you're reading, there's a letter and a preface, and then the first two chapters. I think it's about like 20 pages total. Okay. It's, yeah. Yeah. So we write in the actual book. Oh, good question. I forgot about that. They're not yours. Yeah. Um, so uh, either use a little sticky note to put next to it, or if you do it on a separate piece of paper and you just put the first two words of the quotation down, then you'll know where to find it. And the page number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you want to buy one of your own, they're only $6 on Amazon. They're really cheap. That's like for a new version, and it's the same version we have. But. Okay, and then in the future, I'll switch it over and I will check for some understanding um, in class at the beginning of class. And we'll see how that goes. And if you hate it, we can always go back. Okay. Do you do this every week? No, I haven't taught a lot of that. So, yeah. I don't do this with AP. I don't negotiate with AP. They do what I say. Oh. <laughs>
Um, okay, so yeah, that sounds like a good compromise. Let me write it down. All right, but they're going to be worth the same amount. So if I can't tell that you read from the way that you're writing like the bullet points of what happened in it, then you're not going to get the credit for doing it because then it's, it'll still be worth 10 points. That way, your whole grade is not just dependent on a couple S's because that's could, scary. You could ask us for If I have sure. clarifying questions? Sure. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Because we might think of it differently. All right. Okay. All right, so let's move on and talk about Frederick Douglass then. Take out your word of the day. We still got to talk about it. Okay, our word today is genre. No, it's not a class. Okay. Do you need one? Uh, no, I, Can you just take a picture of Allie's once you once she's written it? Is that okay, Allie? Okay. Then we'll just include that. Okay. All right. Genre is a category of storytelling characterized by similarities. A category of storytelling. Category of storytelling characterized by similarities in form, style, or subject matter. Category of storytelling characterized by similarities in form, style, or subject matter. Another way we talk about that form, style, and subject matter is this idea of tropes. So genres include tropes, which means that genres share certain qualities together. Maybe all romantic comedies have super bright lighting. That would be an example of form that they share together, right? Or um, maybe all slasher films end with a final girl. That would be like a kind of, um, what's it? Subject matter. Yeah, that'd be more of like a subject matter thing. Or like um, all like, um, I don't know, a style question, a style one. Style might be more like the bright lighting and form is more like romantic comedies are usually 90 minutes or form usually has a certain three act structure. So like in a romantic comedy, it's boy meets girl in a very cute way called the meet cute. I read that last year if you have me. Um, and then, you know, boy loses girl in some way through some misunderstanding and then boy finds girl with all variations of gender in that, right? Like that's kind of the, the the form of that kind of story. Okay, so um, there is a genre I want to talk about. This is your example, and it's called slave narrative. That's what we're going to be reading. Okay, um, on that same piece of paper where you were taking all the notes before, I want you to write down all of the different characteristics of a slave narrative, because there won't be room on the word of the day sheet. And we're just going to make a list. So basically, these are books that were written kind of starting around 1790 that were written for the purpose of ending the slave trade and ending slavery. Um, they were written in mostly England and America. Um, and they it was a genre. It was um, something that people looked for. Like these were very popular stories, actually, very popular books. Um, there was one called The Interesting Life of... Ulada uh, Aquino. Um, there was one called Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. You maybe have heard of 12 Years a Slave. That was one of these. Um, or the one we're going to read is probably the most famous of them all, uh, Narrative of the, of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. So the, these were really popular books, and they would actually make their writers quite a lot of money, which was nice because their writers needed that money. Um, and they were stories, they were um, memoirs, told from the perspective of the slave about how they experienced slavery and how they got out of slavery eventually. And they always had these different tropes in them. And these tropes are usually were in a, you know, an effort to appeal to a certain audience. So the first thing these would always include is a portrait. 
they would always have a picture of the writer at the beginning, uh, usually like a wood etching. Um, and it would like show, it always showed the writer in like very fancy dress, like, you know, like a ascot, those like, I don't know, like scarf things that's tucked in and like a three piece suit and like a nice tie and like um, really, you know, nicely like sort of fashion hair for the time period. It was all like very much like centered on making that writer look wealthy and like presentable. And part of that was because these were stories from people who had been former slaves. And so they wanted to kind of dress up the picture to give them a sense of credibility. Um, a lot of these tropes are very offensive, by the way. Okay, the second thing that it will have is they will always have testimonials at the beginning from white readers. And usually those readers were people who were prominent in the uh, anti-slavery movement, which is called abolition, abolitionist movement. So Frederick Douglass actually has like the most prominent member of that movement in his uh, in writing a preface to his book, William Lloyd Garrison, who basically started the anti-slavery society in the United States. Um, so yeah, a lot of times prominent, yeah. Um, they will always include these kind of letters at the beginning. And the letters will always be about, hey, I know this guy, he's my friend. And yes, these things happen to him. As though those white letter writers have any idea what happened to that slave. Like these were guys from the North. It's not like they were like growing up with Frederick Douglass. They were just like vouching for him. So it was sort of like, yes, he's black. I know we have problems with that in our society. He's a good guy. Like it's very offensive way to start your book, but there it is. And it started to get, it kind of gave like readers confidence to trust, to trust him. Because if this guy says he's okay, then I guess he's okay. All right, number three, they always start, I was born. And they give circumstances of the birth. But the circumstances are not always secure. They often have parentage that is unknown. So often they will know their moms, but not their dads, because that's the way that slavery worked, um, where babies were taken away from their mom, their fathers right away, and from their moms when they, you know, got old enough. Um, so a lot of times these will start with this, and Frederick Douglass definitely does. All right, one trope will be a description of cruelty under a master. And this will always include an account of whipping. There's all sorts of cruelty that happened under slavery, all sorts of horrible things that happened under slavery, violence wise. Um, but uh, these stories choose to focus on whipping. And we wanna talk about why that's the particular form of cruelty that's going to speak to this audience. Um, but yeah, there will be descriptions of that. And so, um, this is something to be aware in the first two chapters that you're going to read for next time. It's, it's gruesome. It gets really graphic, um, but it's what happened to someone. So it's our responsibility to read it. Okay. Um, it will also have an account of a slave who stood up against slavery. So, um, that can end obviously two ways in these books. One way they are severely punished, but more often, which I think is fascinating in these books, they will almost always include a story of a slave who rebelled against the system and it worked. So they'll have a story about a slave who like refused to be whipped or like grabbed the whip from the master, right? And the master says, okay, I will never whip you again. Um, or they'll have the descriptions of slaves who actually did escape to the North and you know, are free now forevermore. So they'll have like a lot of times they'll have a story of rebellion that's successful. Okay, number seven. They point out often that slaves were not allowed to read and write. And that's super important in a book in book form, because these aren't just people like telling their stories, these are people who have written down the book, right? And so there's a way that they're saying like they weren't allowed to read and write, but me, the author, I have kind of like broken those rules and now here's my narrative. Um, and a lot of these books will see reading and writing as a way out of slavery as well. 
All right, number eight, they will often have a description of Christianity, and I'm going to put that in quotation marks because they are always talking about, when they do this, they are talking about the hypocrisy of Christianity in the South. So they're talking about slave masters who were Christians and how that might how that might work for them. Frederick Douglass will do that a lot in his book, so be prepared for that. Number nine, they will do, these are super interesting too, they will do exact depictions of the exchange involved in slavery. So it will be like a description of capitalism, basically. It will say, okay, we uh, worked for 12 hours a day um, and we received one pound of cornmeal. Or we, uh, you know, we worked from the time we were five until our death and we were provided with this kind of bedding and this kind of clothing and so on. So they will kind of account for the exchange. And we'll talk about why they would do that, but it's like, it's a criticism of how the, how the South felt like, um, you know, they were providing something in return for the work they were doing. Okay, and then the last one, there will be an account of a slave auction, and if not an auction, auction, they will still talk about families being torn apart. So either by being sold um, without the auction or through through the auction, but quite often they will have depictions of like how slaves were being evaluated at auction. Their book will have that too, where they're, you know, they're looking at his muscles and they're looking at his teeth and so on. Okay, so 10 different tropes that you see in almost every single slave narrative. I These things happen to Douglas. Um, but other things happened to Douglas too, and he chose not to include them in this narrative. He kind of follows the rules of the genre like really closely. So when I talk about this, I'm not saying that he had a choice in like he was inventing certain things for the story, but he was like meeting audience expectations by talking about these tropes. So on your word of the day again, let's talk about the effects of these tropes as a genre. So why do you think, first of all, let's talk about who their audience might have been. So people writing slave narratives, and I know you haven't read any yet, but people writing slave narratives in the 1800s. Who do you think is meant to read those narratives? Let's start with North versus South. Let's say an American book. Are Northerners going to read this or are Southerners going to read it? Northerners. Why do you say so? No, if you wanted to convince Southerners that slavery is bad for them, you're going to approach it in a totally different way, right? You're not going to try and do it by gaining like sympathy or by showing the evils of the system and so on. So yes, you're totally right. Meant for Northerners. Um, white Northerners or Black Northerners? It's going to be mostly White Northerners. Um, and the reason is because Black Northerners are mostly going to be very aware of what happens under slavery. And a lot of the purpose of these books is just saying, this is what happened to me. All right, um, what do you think about education level? Yeah, why do you say that? That's a big deal in the 1800s. Literacy rates are not high. So if you know how to read, you probably are, you do have some formal education. Okay, good. And you also want to appeal to the rich because they can do something. So ultimately our purpose here is let's support the abolitionist cause. And a lot of times supporting a cause has to do with money. And I just like give it to people that have power to change it. Yeah, so these guys, let's, let's include these guys, have the power to, to change the system. Yeah, it's not just about gaining sympathy from people. It is about actually getting them to act. All right, so then we look at all of these different tropes. Which do you think, or I mean, they all are meant to appeal to this audience, but in what way are some of these tropes meant to appeal to this audience? Yes, if you have a A lot of it, yeah. Like a lot, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they just like, don't say they are, but they definitely have that mindset, so it's kind of that. Yeah, good. So, um, when Frederick Douglass was first writing this book and first telling about his story, he, has let, he met with a lot of skepticism from people because he is what is called an auto, ooh, that is not how you spell it. An auto 
autodidact. Anyone know what that word means? It means you're self-taught, completely self-taught for a coach like this. So the story is, and you're gonna read about this, but the story is that one of his slave masters sort of, uh, she had never owned a slave before. And she was like, oh, this child, he was eight at the time. I should teach him how to read. So she taught him his ABCs, just this is what these letters are. And then her husband was like, you cannot teach him how to read. That will make him so unhappy in this life and uh, he will rebel against us, so on. So she stopped teaching him, but Frederick Douglass took that very basic knowledge and he went out and he conned little boys into teaching him their like literacy lessons. Um, and he would copy signs in the dirt and he taught himself to read and write. And when you read this book, not that I'm saying the audiences are excused for this number two, but when you read this book, no, that's just funny. Let me say that. Um, when you read this book, you're going to kind of understand why audiences in 1840 would have some skepticism because the writing in it is amazing. It is like really, really good. Right? I could absolutely not write like Frederick Douglass, not in a million years. So the fact that he's getting testimonials was partly because people were like, "There is no way this guy." just like four years out of slavery could write like this. So um, that's part of it. Okay, well, what other tropes up here are gonna to appeal to our audience? Shows how bad slavery was. All right, good. So if we are talking to these two right here, white northerners, you wanna convince them that there's a reason to act. And so you depict things in very, you depict things very cruelly, you depict the cruelty, that's it. You depict the cruelty and you make that the center of your story so that they can they are compelled to act. Yeah, Brent. I'm probably the six one too because then it shows like it can be changed. Like it's yes. not like an impossible feat. You create this sense of hope. If you didn't want people to want to change it, like you're trying to get people to act. And if you're gonna have this bleak story where nothing can be done, then people aren't gonna act. They're just gonna be complacent. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I, I think a lot of this is about relatability and making sure that you understand that we're all humans. It's not just black men and white men. Yeah, Dash? Uh, I think the portrait uh, makes it so that um, he's kind of showing the white people kind of like you. Yes. So like, and so people are more likely to listen to him when he says that it's still like from the dress that he is. Yes. So I think it's commonality in dress, and then I think it's also emphasizing the difference in skin color too, to say like, and he is black. Yeah, go Yes. It's such an important part of this story because the South at the time had a lot of rhetoric about how we're doing it because we care about these people and we want to take care of them and what would they do without us. And so they want to emphasize that like, no, they're doing it for money reasons. They're doing it for selfish reasons that are based on capital. Yeah. Okay, write down some of this stuff under effects. Write down why you think these tropes are gonna have an effect on the audience. And then that is all for today. Um, so for next time, there's a reader, there's a letter and a preface in this. So it's part of the rhetoric, like it's important to read that. It's not the most exciting part of the book. So again, you're finding logos, ethos, and pathos in the letter and the preference, or in the preface. Um, but know that when you get to chapter one and two, okay, it sounds weird because it contains all these tropes. So it's obviously like a very dark, very depressing book. But at the same time, it's also really compelling. And he's a great writer. So I've never had a student who didn't like this book. Like I've always had students who are like kind of, I don't know, at least interested in keeping in reading. So get through the letter in the preface and then you'll see. You're reading through chapter two. Oh, yeah, you're the logo see that stuff. Yeah.